we're live. Okay, we're joined this hour by Carrie Rosinski, who is a poet, a teacher, a uh, an author. Um, very very excited to uh, to to have you here with us this hour. So, uh, Carrie, you you you've been all around the world doing poetry. You've you've you've, uh, yeah. you've taught different places. You've you've um, won a number of slams. But before any of that started, you know, you decided you wanted to write. So, like, let's let's uh, let's yeah. start at the beginning. When, when was uh when did you first know you want to be a writer? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I started writing stories when I was really little, and I was actually a bit of a plagiarist. I um, would read a story when I was just learning to write, and like like six or six or seven, you know, and I would copy the story in my own words and kind of rewrite it. And so I had this like love for language and storytelling. I think from the very beginning. I wrote my first poem when I was 12. I was at a Girl Scout meeting and they were like, we're gonna write poems today. Um, and I just started writing poems and I got kind of addicted to it. And uh, I was really good at, at English papers and things like that in high school. Like I took AP uh, writing classes and I loved uh, writing stories, um, but I kept poems private. I didn't show them really to anybody and um, I wrote kind of terrible like love poems in my journal. And uh, it wasn't until I went to Emerson College um, that I signed up for a class called Poetry as per about the fact that I would have to read my poems out loud, having not really shown them to many people. Um, and that class, like the second week of that class, we went to the Cantab Lounge in Boston as our field trip and it changed my life. Yeah, so 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 tell us about uh, your entry into the world of slam. Oh, um, slam. So I started going to the Cantab then while I was in college. I went every week for um, about the six years that I lived in Boston, uh, both during and after school. Um, but I I went for several months and I didn't read out loud. I was really intimidated by um, the the people who were there. I mean the Boston greats were just like reading every single week. So I was seeing, you know, Simone Bobian and um, Oz and uh, Brian S. Ellis and Rick McIntyre and Eric Hagan and all these great people um, who just were reading there every week. And this was 2005. And um, I, so I went for a couple months before I, before I read. And then I started to just read on the open mic and I didn't slam until maybe 2007 um, or 2008, when I started um, competing with the Emerson College Slam team. We were the inaugural team, and that's when I started competing. But it, I waited I waited and kind of developed my voice before I started competing, which I'm really um, glad and grateful that I did, that I gave myself that time to develop as a writer instead of just competing and trying to sound like someone else yeah no you definitely have a very distinct style so can you talk a little bit about how you how over the course of time you developed that style um i mean i've always loved something that simone bobian said she was a slam master at cantab and was my one of my first coaches um in poetry and she said that she booked um writers because she wanted her audience and her poets to try on the voice of those features every week and um, and then like eventually develop their own voices through trying on other people's voices. Um, and so I was deeply influenced um, at various stages by my community. And in those early years, I think I was really influenced by Shira, Shira Ehrlichman, um, Brian S. Ellis and Omazeli Aquao um, were probably like three of my bigger influences. Um, and helped me kind of develop my own style. So I really loved the image heavy um, storytelling that was happening. And I think in my very early work, I um, really utilized like my film background in that I was very image heavy and kind of almost nonsensical at times in the way that I created like new words and language. And as I developed and grew as an artist and started touring, that really started impacting me and I think a big change happened in my voice when I moved to Denver um, and I became a much more political poet because I moved to Denver and uh, lived in their community and 
started writing very different poems, I think. So I feel really lucky that I've lived and existed in many different slam communities because I think each one has had a really big impact on my sound and like how I was interacting with my own voice. Yeah. So when you moved to Denver, it was a uh, was a uh, like kind of like um, Mercury the Mercury Cafe was that like a big? Yeah, so I slammed at the Merc and I represented them at a Wowps one year, um, and I did go to Nuba. I didn't really slam or compete much at Nuba, but um, I would go to their events. I did feature there a couple times and things like that. So um, I love the Denver community. I lived there about ten months, but I was visiting a lot because that's where my partner lived. So. Um, yeah, I just really fell in love. They became like a another family, which was really awesome to have like this Boston family and then to have this like um, Denver family and then to move to Los Angeles. And, you know, it just felt like I was I was getting these little insights and being welcomed into different communities, which was really cool. So this is kind of like a hopefully designed, uh, you know, um, for Final Destination. Uh, for a, a wide cross section of, of people who might not be as familiar with different things, so can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about like uh, the National Poetry Slam and what that what that um, I don't know is or was or I don't really know what's going on with it right now. But like <laughs> at, the time, at the time you were doing it, can you tell us a little bit about what those things are like when with all these people mm. from all these different cities and how you kind of particularly experienced it? Yeah, I so I started going to college nationals, which was cool because that was all college students. And I even um, ran a college nationals in 2010 after I'd competed twice at it. Um, and so it was cool to get the experience both as the competitor and one of the organizers because they are these massive festivals, both for college nationals and the National Poetry Slam, where you have teams from all of schools or cities. Um, or venues coming to compete. And so it is really interesting. It's like this meshing of voices and families and styles. And it's weird to be like, here's my art, judge it, you know? But they're, the part of going to nationals is the parties at night and the ciphers that happen in people's hotel rooms. And um, I don't know, getting to, to experience and see different things with, with the team that you're with. And I went to nationals now, the National Poetry Slam three times, twice with Boston and once with um, DPL, Los Angeles. Um, and then I competed at the Individual World Poetry Slam and uh, the Women of the World Poetry Slam. I think I did IWIPS twice, I think. Yeah, twice. And I did WOWPS maybe four times. Um, and those are different because you're an individual competing against other people. So it's a bit different than having that team camaraderie around you. But it's also a really amazing experience. So, yeah. so, so, um, you've mentioned earlier that you went on tour. So, did a lot of that touring kind of emerge out of out of doing the the, the national slams? Yeah, I um, so I started uh, I started touring in two thousand ten, um, and my very first tour was with April Ranger. Um, who is still one of my best friends. Uh, we were just Skyping the other night talking about how long we've known each other. Um, but yeah, I think touring was a really scary venture the very first time, first few times I did it. Um, and now it's like one of my favorite things that I get to do in my life. I love performing. I love meeting people and interacting with people. And I still tour um, now that I live in New Zealand. I still tour there as well. So it's it's just, yeah, it's maybe my my replacement to doing big competitions is touring and meeting people in venues and stuff like that. So what, what was, when you first go on tour uh, here in the United States, where, where was, mm -hmm. what was the, what were some of the cities that, um, that, that were, what, that you found kind of most surprising and interesting when you were, when you were doing all that? Mm. I don't know. I, rem I remember my first tour really well because April and I went to the West Coast and we did like Seattle, Portland um, and down all the way down to Los Angeles. Um, and yeah, I don't know. We've I've, I've toured a lot of different places. I think um, in the U.S., I love getting to go back to the Northeast because it's where I started doing poetry. Um, but yeah, I've had amazing shows and met amazing people in all different places. I mean, yeah, I just feel really lucky that I've had shows, you know, from Austin, Texas to Detroit to Chicago. I mean, I've always loved going to Chicago. There's something magical about going back to 
where I was, where I'm originally from, but didn't do any poetry there. So I don't know. There's just cool things about everything. I've always loved going to LA though, because it's like LA became my home and my family before I ever lived there through touring. So um, it has a special place in my heart for that reason. So you slammed for the poetry lunch. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, tell us a little bit. I mean, we had Shion on. We had the opportunity to interview Shion and the inter uh, in, uh, yeah. opportunity to interview Javon as well. Um, and so, like, uh, can you tell our eyes a little bit about just how important uh, the Poetry Lounge is uh, to the whole, like, uh, hmm. you know, word slam community throughout the nation? Yeah, I think I feel like I had a really unique experience because I came with a, a reputation and um, a history in the slam scene before I moved to LA and became part of that team. Um, and I also came with like a, an idea of who certain people like Javon and Shihan were. And then once I was on the team, I was like, oh my God, like these people are my family. Like I didn't expect them to be as amazing or as kind and welcoming as they were. Um, and I think DPL is really unique and important because there is this, this like misconception about DPL and, you know, the people who go there as to what that is. I remember Javon sat us down before we went to nationals and was like, um, hey, people are going to treat you differently because you're on this team. And I was like, what? And I've been to nationals. What are you talking about? And um, we went and I feel like I was lucky because I had all these relationships prior. I'd been on different teams and gone to nationals and indies and stuff. But I went and I watched my teammates get treated really differently by people. And I watched people not clap for my team at bouts. And I was shocked. I was blown away by the attitudes that came uh, from people I respected and people I liked towards my team just because of their reputation or their history. Um, and I think that, yeah, I don't know. I, I ride or die for DPL now. Like I would definitely go to bat to defend them because I think it's an important community and an important stage both within LA and for people outside of LA. So, uh, so I'm really curious. So, so uh, I'm really, this is kind of a, one of the more interesting parts of it for me. So you're, you, you uh, had a, you were teaching at CSUN for a little bit. How did that come about? Oh, that was really random, actually. Um, I had met this amazing woman, Stacy Jones, um, Stacy Holman Jones, I think. Um, she now lives in Australia, funny enough, as I live in New Zealand. Um, but she, I don't even remember how we met or how it came about, but uh, the, I'd come and guest taught like a couple workshops and things at CSUN for her. And then the teacher who taught this performance poetry class, um, had a medical emergency and she couldn't teach the rest of the semester. And so Stacy recommended me to step in and be the, come the teacher and CSUN was desperate and they were like, yeah, sure, you can do it. Um, so that was a, that was a really great and important experience. Um, I think I, there were like 30, 35 students in the class. It was quite a big course um, and they weren't writing their own poems they were memorizing it was like a theater course for them to memorize work and perform it and so it was definitely performance based uh, and it was cool it was great because um, when I moved to New Zealand I got a job at a university there and I just spent I just finished my my time my tenure there but I spent four years teaching tertiary level spoken word and other writing and performance classes. And I credit CSUN for giving me the the kind of footing to have the confidence to go do that. So I'm um, which leads to the, the I mean the, the most natural next question. Like how did you end up in New Zealand? I mean, how did the <laughs> how did the transition from CSUN to New Zealand? Um so my relationship with New Zealand began in 2011. I was um backpacking like with my brother and we went to New Zealand and I fell in love with the country. And um, several months later, I went back with um, a friend who had become my partner. <laughs> and uh, Ken and I toured around New Zealand and I ended up backpacking there for sev several months by myself as well. And so I just, I loved it there. I felt at home there and it became this dream that I worked towards for several years about moving there. and. Um, when I moved there, I thought I was just gonna live there a year. Like I took two bags, that was it. Um, 
and five years later, <laughs> I still live there, and um, yeah, it's great. I'm, uh, sometimes there's a little slight echo, so I put myself on mute there. Um, no, that's fantastic. That's a, that's that's incredible. It's, I mean, I don't think people. Right? Yeah, I'm unmuted. I don't think people realize like just, just how far. Oh, sorry. Oh, there. There we go. I don't people think people just how far that uh, you know that that this that this art form can take people all around the world. I mean, you know, like oh yeah, you're one of the totally. you and Ken are definitely one of the kind of the, the most glaring examples. But the, you're not alone. I mean, there's a lot of people mm. that have have uh, not only you know it has not only taken around the country but around the world. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I mean, yeah. So like, um, I don't I don't really have a question for that. Just is kind of a. <laughs> No, but it is it is something because I think that um, like I didn't go to school for this. Like I this is a passion of mine that like accidentally developed, you know, and I think that my parents were always like, well, when are you going to go use your film degree? Like and I did when I lived in L.A., but it wasn't it was like all these doors just kept opening with poetry. And I do think I'm quite ambitious in terms of just making things happen for myself, like. I briefly had an agent, but I don't do any of this through an agent. Like, it's just pure, like, this is what I love to do. And this is me cold calling and emailing and trying to make things happen through my reputation or networking and stuff. And there are people who are way better at it than I am. Um, but I'm glad that it's gotten me so far and I still get to do what I love to do. Yeah. I just, uh, I just actually, the, the, the previous interview to this uh, was, um, Carlos uh, Andreas Gomez, mm -hmm. um, and um, I want to ask I want to ask you the same question I, I posed to him, which was, um, what advice do you have for people who are getting into the college circuit? Like, what are some of the things they should mm -hmm. know when 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 pursuing, um, you know, either supplementing their income or making it their income? What is it that they should know when they try and you know start getting involved in uh, you know in booking in booking shows at colleges? Yeah, it's been many years now since I've done the U.S. college circuit for sure, um, but I would say. There can be some brutal, soul-sucking experiences through that. Um, I remember this time I got booked for one of my highest paying gigs was at a university, like, I don't know, fun night where they had comedians and jugglers and randomly me. Um, and it was one of the hardest like shows I ever did because people were like having a food fight in the room and like not paying attention to little old me at the time. And um and I think that those situations, those really terrible shows are just as important as the really good shows. They shaped me just as much. And so I think that recognizing that it might seem like it's easy and it's not necessarily easy, but it will make you a better performer and a stronger performer. And you will meet and interact with people who are amazing, who are impacted and connecting with you through those experiences. But there is something about getting tough skin and and being able to trust your voice and trust who you are in in those experiences so there was like a literal food fight i mean like there were there, there were, were like, there were like things going on in that room that were just not supposed to be happening during a poetry reading for sure like <laughs> it was a wild time that was back in like 2010 i think yeah no that, that that's <laughs> yeah it was wild yeah. Oh well, you know, yeah. Well, you ever have to like compete with people like uh um like they say like all right everyone like uh, it's like a, a wide event and there's it's like a big event with just all kinds of people and they're like um all right everyone we're gonna have a poet on you know make sure you go get go get the go get the go get the barbecue get the food yeah. <laughs> they like writing poetry while yeah. people are, like, filling their plate you know yes <laughs> no it's just the number of situations that I've been in both at like spaces that are dedicated for poetry and had horrible things happen during them. Like those things made me better, made me stronger. I can tell you for sure the worst thing that ever happened to me, I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but the worst thing that ever happened to me, I put it in a poem. A guy pretended to masturbate on me oh after God. I got off stage because he hated, I called him out and he hated that I like tried to stop his <laughs> harassment on stage and no one said anything to him it was something that I had to confront him about and it's now it's like mind-boggling that it happened but um I think that that's what's that's what's exciting and scary about live art is that anything can happen and hopefully it's going to help you become stronger better you know more powerful in your belief in your own work um 
Yeah. Wow. Random. That was on a college campus? No, that wasn't on a college campus. It was um, in Austin, Texas. I mean, I didn't make it any better. I mean, I didn't make it like any, any like. No, no, yeah. He was, he was like an adult. He was like an adult human who 100% should have known better, but did it anyway. So. Yeah. Wow. That's wonderful. Yeah. Terrible. Um, so, so how much did... material for my feminist film, though? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? Speaking of which, I, I, I know I, I didn't, I didn't ask you ahead of time, so I, I kind of messed up. So you could just say no, and then we just move on. <laughs> More questions, but is there anyone you can care upon? Um, yeah, sure. All right, what cool. kind of poem you want to hear? Uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a quintessential uh, Rosinski poem. You know, like the. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, it'll be it'll be like a few minutes. Is that okay? And like. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Um, then I will read you. You want me to do it now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I will read you this poem that I love. Um, it's gonna be on my upcoming album, but I'll tell you more about that later when we talk about future things. Um, this is called Always a Godmother, Never a God. When I talk to my mother on the phone, she is 18 hours behind me in time. My life came from her life and I live in her future. I am her laugh exploding out an open window into God's hungry mouth. My mother has always believed in God and I have always believed in her. She is more prayer than person. Her voice, the only sound in this world I crave. And I ask her if God learned everything he knows from his mother too. My mother carved me from her rib, a soft weapon made of bone my body skin of spoiled milk, freckled lips and hips, my short shorts and shaved head, my mother, the God who made me, says I cannot go anywhere without stealing the eyeballs of humans who do not deserve the honor of looking at me. And we laugh, we women as tall as redwoods, no pierced ears or lipstick to hide us. And I ask her, if every human on this planet came from inside of a woman, why would we ever believe God was a man? but we both know no godmother would allow this world to exist. So like all the mothers before her, she's taught me how to live in a world full of men. My mother tells me that when she was at university, there was a series of campus rapes. And when walking home at night, she would wear a men's jacket and raise the hood. So she might be mistaken for a man. So she might survive what it is to be a woman. And I ask her, if one woman survives, does another cry out in the dark? Once I stood on a street corner in Denver, Delhi, Detroit, and a man licked the length of my legs with his eyeballs. Once a man asked me to smile, and when I didn't, he called me a cunt. Once I discovered there is no record for the maiden names of my great grandmothers and whole women went up in smoke. Once they called me sir as if my body had not been forced to beg for survival while walking through a city. My body, the machete. My body, the miracle my mother gave me. My body praying to some unseen God, but my mother was the only one to ever pray back. My mother, the moon I howled to in the dark. She taught me to slit their throats with my tongue, to rip out their teeth and remind them of the ghost woman I come from, but I am always a godmother, never a god. So like all the women before me who birthed a man only to have him strangle their daughters in the dark, I pray to myself. I pick up the phone and wait for my mother's voice like the ocean waits to lift my body in a wave, like a man waits to watch me cross the street, like a godmother waits to give birth to a new God. Mm. That's it. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. So oftentimes, uh, you know, like when when you know you you write, uh, you know, the poetry is so like clear and so it's 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 so very it's very you know, very you know it's very uh, you're taking up a, you know, the plight of uh, mm. that, that exists out in the world. Um, you end up like in different places. You end up you end up not just not just amongst other poets, but actually, um, you find yourself at, you know invited to things where you're on on the right side of you is a is as an academic on the other side, as an yeah. organizer. So, have you found yourself in, in many in many situations where you're you're you know you're brought in as the poet to open mm. up this, this big conference on you know like femicide or global you know? You know um, yeah, sometimes I mostly do writers festivals. I've done a TEDx just recently last year, um, which was 
one of the best experiences of my life. Um, and yeah, I guess I've done, I've definitely been in lots of situations where, um, where I'm surrounded by people of different mindsets or different backgrounds than me. And I'm the, you know, entertainment or the, <laughs> the performer for the night. Yeah. Um, I think something that was, I don't know if this is related, but it's popped into my mind um, that when I, when I was teaching at the university in New Zealand, the last few years, um, I taught in multiple departments. So I taught in the creative writing department and I also taught in the performing arts department. And I taught in one other department where I mostly taught essay writing. But um, the it was interesting. It was like I didn't belong in either department. They both thought of me as being the others. So like I was too much of a writer for the performers and I was too much of a performer for the writers. And I feel like that's been a thread like through most of my life is like, where do I belong and how do I fit in there? Because I'm too American for the New Zealanders and I'm too much of a weirdo for the Americans. Like I've lived overseas too long, you know? Yeah. So it's like this strange, like existing in this strange in between where no one really wants me. I'm too much of something else for, for everybody, you know? And I think that that's something I'm constantly struggling with um, to be taken seriously as a writer, but to, you know, be a mo a more of a performer for theater people. And I don't know, that's like a constant thread right now in my life. Yeah. Yeah, I guess what I meant more was was by like uh, I understand I understand what you're saying as an artist, mm. but like I'm thinking like um, it's like almost being like the poet laureate of a cause. I mean, like not to say mm. that, but like say like to to it's it's the it's the the politics of what you're saying. Mm. Uh, so you find that they bring you into into contact with people that it's like um, like it'll be like a, a conference on let's say like you know violence against women or something. Like that. Oh right, like, yeah. More the poet, and then like that's like um, you find yourself being the only poet in the room in those instances. Yeah, sure. I mean, but I think that that's often like because I'm in a room full of writers who write fiction and they're like, oh, look at this performance poet over here. <laughs> like, and, um, but yeah, I, my work has become more political and um, at, over time. And so therefore, like, I've opened myself up to be involved in situations because my work speaks to that um, cause or that, you know, theme on, on something for sure if that answers kind of what we're yeah, 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 it's just, you know, it, it, there's a tendency to always try to find parallels with the person mm -hmm. you're talking to. So I'm like, it's like, it's like yeah. Well, yeah, cause that's been my life. It's always, always been like, I've, but that was yeah. very interesting for me. Like, I want to be the only poet in the room. I want to make sure that like, I'm like this. And mm. right next to me, here's this guy, he, he was like, I was at the moratorium. And then someone, someone next to me is like, and like you know, like, <laughs> book, and then like, you know, so that's always been my, my, my like, that was my, my kind of trajectory. So I was kind of, Curious if you had a, a similar. Yeah, uh, sometimes. Yeah. But, yeah. So how 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 has it been readjusting to life in New Zealand? I mean, like, how is how is our how are you adjusting to the, the poetry scene there? What mm. is the poetry like? Yeah, it's great. I love it. Um, there's, I mean, there's always room for improvement in every community. Um, but yeah, when I moved there, I think the poetry community really caught me in terms of like every time I've moved to a new city, I've looked for the poetry community. I've looked for the writers and it's kind of provides you with like instant friends, essentially. It's like, great. I have this hobby that everyone else also likes, except it's not my hobby. It's my career. So, um, and I was just actually talking about this with Aaron Samuels the other night, cause we were once, um, roommates and I realized, you know, I've lived in like 14 different cities and three different countries and I've had 72 roommates in my life. And he was like, that's way too many roommates. Um, but uh, yeah, so we mo I moved to New Zealand and the poetry community just kind of helped support us because it wasn't like an easy transition. I didn't move there with a job or anything. So I worked kind of shit jobs for a while and kind of got my feet underneath me. And, um, and now my life is 24 seven, like writing and performing and program coordinating, organizing events. Um, so I co-run the Jaffa Poetry Slam, which is the only um, monthly poetry slam in Auckland. There are like an annoying amount of open mics, but there aren't any like regular poetry slams. Um, and so New Zealand had this habit the first few years I lived there of having really big cash prize slams at big literary events. Um, where they would like bring in like expert judges. They're not like randomly selected or anything. They're like expert judges. So I've been an expert judge more times than I can count at big literary events. But um, 
those were great, but I felt like they weren't really, they weren't really like enhanced embracing like the idea that like slam is kind of pointless and so we wanted to create a monthly slam where the prize was 10 bucks and that's it you know and you eventually get to go to the national poetry slam which i also have helped co-run while i've lived there um and yeah and so jaffa is great it's really fun uh and i don't know the the poetry scene is is interesting it's different the style is very different i think that australian and british poetry is quite similar there's like a rap influence it's like a lot of white people rapping influence thing happening um but new zealand's a little bit closer to american style and so i think that made the transition easier um and i love that each part of the country kind of has their own different poets and different styles and you get to see that at the national poetry slam where we have kind of like seven we usually have about seven different regions or cities um, represented in at the, at the National Poetry Slam there, which is basically like an indies. It's not teams. Um, although I do run a team slam through my monthly event. And I'm just blabbing about Auckland slams. <laughs> Very interesting, actually. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about um, uh, Jaffa? Where did that name come from? So Jaffa is a slang term, uh, it's an acronym. It means just another fucking Aucklander. Um, so <laughs> Auckland is the big city in, this, in, in the country. And so it's kind of got that reputation like that LA or New York would have of being like, oh, those city people kind of thing. So when Aucklanders are driving around or something, people will be like, oh, look at those Jaffas, those, those fucking Aucklanders over there. <laughs> so we wanted to embrace that name um and obviously it was founded by americans but we embraced the name for just another fucking auckland poetry slam yeah that's that's funny that's funny <laughs> um yeah we so, found it ourselves yeah so so what what tends what tends to i mean in in, in the u.s as you know there there's trends that kind of flow yeah poetry slam, and um one year a certain type of thing is going to win another year yeah. a certain type of thing win. So what are some of the trends that you're noticing there in uh, in in uh, in uh, New Zealand? Um hmm or is it not as is is it not as trend based? I, there is cuz there was definitely an influx of button poetry sounding stuff um right when I moved there. There were a lot of like young and upcoming poets who were watching a lot of button and so they were like kind of they were even like mimicking American accents at points um which was really interesting to see, but I feel like there are people who kind of developed their own voices. I see more, there's differences between the cities. So Auckland is very, um, I would say much more like serious, dark political work that you would find um, like myself reading. <laughs> uh, but Wellington, which is the capital, uh, has kind of like a lot of limericky, uh, pun poetry happening and that's those these are generalizations for sure like there are people yeah. who break these molds but um and then Christchurch uh down on the south island um which is uh a great city for writing they have an amazing festival there every two years um they are really like storytellers and narrative um and i really love hearing hearing their poetry so it, you can kind of see like those are the three major cities but you'll end up with like what we would call bush poetry from some of the smaller regions that are like kind of those i don't i don't know how to describe it bush poets basically look it up um so yeah i don't know different people different styles and i and i like seeing that those develop and there's some really incredible writers um and and presses that really um promote and and are helping poetry take off in different ways. I mean, when I first toured there, it was like non-existent. Colleges were hanging up on me because I didn't know what the fuck poetry, performance poetry was. And now slam is huge there. Spoken word is, is really big and accepted. So it's cool. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how we survive? Oh yeah. Well, you doing some research. Um, how we survive is my passion project with an amazing New Zealand poet um, named Olivia Hall. She currently lives in London right now. So our uh, our Skype calls, which we do multiple times a week are always precariously timed. Um, but yeah, How We Survive is a feminist poetry show that I wrote um, and created with 
uh, live. And um, it's kind of spawned us into doing a bunch of different things. So we published a book uh, last year in addition to rewriting the show. So we spent nine months rewriting the, the original version of the show. And we toured for six weeks around New Zealand with it. And um, we sold 350 copies of this book that we published. And we put out, we recorded like all the duets from the show. There are eight duet pieces. Um, and it's a 90 minute show, a mix of like individual poems and duets um, and banter, a stage uh, like setting to it, like props and things. Um, and so we toured that for six weeks. We published the book. We also put out a spoken word album called They Will Never Own Us, which is on Spotify. And um, we're currently working on putting together like our next project, um, which will be a digital project because we can't tour this year. So hashtag coronavirus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so how, how is, um, well, I got, I got two kind of questions. So, so mm -hmm. you, you published it, you say, so like who did you publish with? We did it ourselves, but we did it really legit. Like it, I, I'm, I'm really proud of how well the, what the book looks like. We use this great local, um, print shop that a friend of mine, Muhammad Hassan, had printed his book there, and I loved his his book and how it looked, and was like, "Holy shit, this looks super professional!" So it's like a seventy page book that we published with them, and um, we just fronted all the money ourselves, and um, and then we kept we have kept having to go back and print more runs of it because we were selling out of it. Um, like as we were touring around the country over those six weeks, because we were doing both theaters and venues, which was really fun. So we did three, uh, we did four theater performances. So we had like a week long run at different theaters around the country, which was really cool. Um, so that, no, that's really, um, that's, that's, yeah, I, I, so can, can you tell us a little bit like w more about the content of it? I mean, what is- I Oh mean, yeah, like sure. Um, so it's a feminist poetry show. It's really, uh, we want we had specific things that we wanted to write about together. Um, we'd done an original run of the show in like 2016 and it was meant to be like a one-off show and it got protested by these like men's right activists online who didn't want us to do this poetry show because the word feminism was involved. And um, it was great. They made us more successful. We were we actually wrote them like a thank you poem. We're like, thanks for being assholes. Like you made this better. So um, what started as like a one night run became like a three night sold out run that time and just spawned more and more tours until we decided in 2019 to rewrite the show. Um, and the content, it, the content varies. I think there is like a story arc throughout the show, but um, there are individual pieces that that touch on, um, you know, body, body image, and um, I don't know, uh, like love stories as well as um, Brock Turner is like the focus of one piece. Hermione Granger is the focus of another piece. And I think inherently, the idea that we were really exploring was that um, that our personal experiences in our personal lives are. Um, examples of feminism and equality and fighting for, you know, different things, uh, just kind of inherently and naturally. And um, there's so many pieces that I really love in it. One of my favorite pieces is a poem about our obsessions. And it was a poem that we wrote. And we originally, it wasn't quite right. When we once we finally cut like a stanza of it, it flowed perfectly. And it's really funny. And um, we went to this high school of um and we had like 150 girls that were like just screaming and snapping along with the poem um because they hate boys and it's great so there are just a lot of really amazing moments on the tour where we were not only performing in theaters but we were performing in venues we were performing in schools we were teaching workshops um and it was just awesome to have so many people of different lived experiences connect with what we were talking about and um, relate to it so yeah yeah very no that, that, that's 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 excellent so um so tell us about uh tell us about uh, some of your albums that you were you, you had kind of alluded to oh yeah so um a long time ago i released my first album on spotify um called barefoot whale writers it was actually a project i did in college and it was like my final thesis project 
Um, and for some reason, people are like obsessed with this one track on the album. It has like over a hundred thousand plays on Spotify. It's a love poem I wrote like <laughs> and when I was like a sophomore in college. Um, so Barefoot Whale Writers uh, is, is a project that I really loved. Um, and then I also released a live album like a couple years later of a feature I did at the Cantab. And I actually really love that album. I love the performance and the way that it was captured and the DJ at the Cantab just recorded it and gave me the recording of it. So that's called Live at the Boston Poetry Slam. And then I didn't release anything for a decade, which is a weird, like it's weird to be like, oh yeah, that was a decade ago. Um, and so Liv and I just released They Will Never Own Us, which is just uh, mostly duet duets from our show, um, which is cool to have them captured. And it has one indie poem from each of us. And then I'm about to release uh, next month a new album called Break the Ceiling, which is like a 13 track um, album. And so much of my work that I've, it's funny because it feels like there's like all these all these poems that I missed out on like releasing to the world. But these are mostly poems I've written since living in New Zealand. And um, I think there's maybe one that I wrote when I was in LA that I that I still perform called Sober Girl that is on the album. But it's mostly, um, it's mostly feminist work. It's, uh, my mom is like a big theme in the album as well. Um, so she's actually in the cover image with me from when I was a kid, that's gonna be the cover album. Um, but I'm really excited for people to hear it because I feel like it's different than the work that people who've been listening to like Barefoot Whale Writers and Live at the Boston Poetry Slam, they're different poems. It's my voice has changed again, I think, you know, or like developed again from living in New Zealand. So yeah, so I'm excited. So, so I, did you did you say a minute ago that uh, that your your um, your dissertation was was an album? So when I was at Emerson, I was in their honors program. And so I had to have a thesis project at the at the end. And so I actually wrote a 25 page ethnography about spoken word and how venues shape voice. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was mostly based on Northeast um, experiences because that's all I had at that point. But I was really curious about how like rooms shaped how audiences felt and how venues shaped how poets felt in the space. Like if there's a big pole in the middle of the room, it's gonna change how people feel in the space. If there's windows behind you and it's light out and it's like shining in that like makes the room all feel weird. Or like if you go outside to have a poetry reading, it changes everything. And so that's part of what the ethnography was about. And so in addition to writing that 25 page thesis, I also recorded an album of my own poetry. Cause I was like two, it was like three or four years into exploring my own voice as a poet. And so at that point I had enough material to create an album. Yeah. And that, and that served as your thesis. Uh, yeah, it was like I was double dipping everywhere I could, you know, and I yeah, got a yeah. grad student to mix it, record and mix it for me for free because it was like a project that he could then use for one of his classes or whatever. So Emerson was like, I have to give a shout out to Emerson because it was such an impactful part of my life and really shaped me to be the weirdo that I am. So I'm really grateful for going there. Yeah, no, that's really, that's really cool. That's uh I, I like double dipping. I like I like <laughs> like, like making the most. Yeah, yeah. And I, I love free labor is the wrong term, but I love <laughs> collaboration. I like collaboration. I love collaboration, and I also I love, love being in a group of people who are okay with double dipping in the dip. Like that should also yeah. happen. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, yeah. So so where can we find all these? And and it, oh, well, is there plans to 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 expand the twenty five uh, page thesis into? It's like a manuscript or something. Oh thing. no, there's not. That's I feel like I've I have been going through some of my old like uh journals and stuff like that. It's so amazing to see old me and my thoughts. But no, I think that that existed when it needed to between me and my thesis advisor. But um, yeah, I do have like other projects and things that I'm excited to expand and work on. And I'm itching to write a fiction book, so I'm doing research on that at the moment and. Um, I've been like spinning around with this idea for a screenplay um, for quite a long time as well. So yeah. I'm pulling pulling ideas out for those things in addition to all the poetry stuff I do. Yeah. So we have a question from the audience. Um, this is how can we see your show? Oh, it's Shihan. Hey, Shihan. Hey, Shihan. Yeah. I love you. Um, 
So at the moment, I do have a recording of the whole show. Uh, we haven't decided if we're going to put it online yet, but you can see um, video performances from the show on um, my uh, the Facebook page called How We Survive um, a, a Feminist Poetry Show. So um, How We Survive is the name of the show. So you can find that on Facebook and you can see different videos from our duets of the show. I think we've got two or three, two, two or three out at the moment. And you can listen to um, all the duets from the show uh, on Spotify through, <laughs> through uh, the album, They Will Never Own Us. Mm. And no, Shihan, you are still on my zombie apocalypse team. Javon is definitely on my zombie apocalypse team because he just built a table. I don't know if everybody saw this, but it was incredible. I feel like his shelter building skills have probably skyrocketed, so yeah. <laughs> It's just enough to I'm just answering Shihan's questions now. Yeah, no, he has a tendency to do that. Um <laughs> uh, I um this has been a this has been a wonderful uh, 45 minutes so far that we've we've got to spend. It's very illuminating. Um is there any way you can share another poem? Oh, you want me to share another one? If you have if, if you have the time and inclination. I do, yeah, sure. Um now I have to think about um okay, I'm gonna share another one that's on the my album let me just find in my organ i'm very organized i actually people make fun of me for this but um i have a folder on my computer and then like i have folders for every single year that i write poems and then i date all of my poems and i write like the name of the poem and the draft number so i'm incredibly anal and my students are always like yeah i'm not doing that but i try i try to impose it on them Okay, so hopefully this is the right version. Um, this is called Love Me Like a Teenage Girl. And this will be on Break the Ceiling next month. They say I break too easily, crumble like coal through clean fingers, but I do not make mistakes. I am an ever unfolding mistake. I am always folding my tongue into a dagger. I cut myself in silence, relive my most embarrassing moments every Sunday night before I fall asleep because Catholics do not forgive themselves. I am forgiving myself. I am folding my tongue into a kinder girl. I whisper my darkest fears while you sleep. Before I break off your favorite rib and put it back inside of me, I plant tiny flags in your skin, hiss at the girl in glasses who asks if you're single girl. I am always sober. I will cut you on each of my molars before you can even open your pink mouth. I am territorial as fuck, but in love with the chase. I am a tease in the dark. All want, want until you give. I love putting distance between us so I can imagine life before you came into it. You think I love too hard, but when I was in high school, I would watch the end of The English Patient on VHS just so I could cry and imagine being carried dead through the desert. I am trained in the art of weeping while being held in the dark. I cry in complete silence, my body Noah's Ark. I steal little pieces of everyone around me so I don't drown, but I am too soft in all of the wrong places. I want you to love me like a teenage girl, obsessed and unbroken terrified and forgiving, screaming my name like I am a small god. I want to Netflix and chill by myself because I understand desire born from distance. I am nothing if not alive while barefoot and I offer another hour of my life to the tiny screen inside of my pocket. I worship like a millennial in front of the mirror. I burn like an overdue library book. I love like my Catholic school uniform tossed onto a bonfire. I drive like a teenager and sleep like a lioness. I am afraid of heights, but I fuck with spiders. I lived on a waitress salary for six years, and now I teach in South Auckland, so I'm still wearing the clothes I bought a decade ago. I'm thrifty, but I have expensive taste in breakfast. My mother has stopped asking me to shave my legs. But strangers keep asking when I'm gonna get married, like a woman's gotta belong to someone other than herself. Like life is a ladder and all they want me to do is climb. When I imagine the future, I imagine myself in it. I am the definition of manifest destiny, all passports and no children. I am selfish as fuck and I do not want to apologize, but I keep saying sorry to inanimate objects I bump into. I am the same age my mother was when she gave birth to me. I am an ancestor of global warming, and someday they will point to me and say, she came like the flood, like locusts in the field. 
like a prophecy no one predicted, and they, they will scream my name. Fantastic work, fantastic work, fantastic Thank work. Thank you. Um, I, I want to get I want to get this one last question in here, um, uh, and then I want to um, get another plug for your, for for every, everywhere we can find your work and and, and follow uh, what you're what you're up to next. But this final question here comes from Shion Van Keith again. It says, "Can Matt pass for someone who lives in Middle Earth?" <laughs> um, yeah, sure, of course. I think they're yeah. very accepting there. All right. All people. Uh, if you have an extended question here. Zan asks, are there Chicanos in Middle Earth? And I'll handle that one. There are Chicanos everywhere. All right. So um <laughs> <laughs> But there's no good Mexican food in New Zealand. So please somebody move there and start a great burrito place. <laughs> <laughs> there's no good Mexican food in New Zealand. I I, I, I can imagine that there's, there's really not there's no places in the world. Mexican food is very popular, but it's not always well done. Exactly, and we yeah. need it desperately. So, so um, okay. So, so um, where can we find your work? Where can people follow up with what you're up to? And uh, where can they, you know, purchase the book, the albums, etc.? Um, yeah. So you can. Uh, I've got pages on Facebook under my name, Carrie Rudzinski. Um, I have an Instagram where I post a lot of my work up called uh, under Splinter Cheek. I had to think for a second what my handle name was. Um, and I have three albums going to be four soon on Spotify and iTunes, which you can find them there. And um, unfortunately, the best place to buy my poetry book online is on Amazon. I'm sorry. I apologize about that. Um, but it's called The Shotgun Speaks. Uh, it was published in 2013. Um, and that's the, I think that's the only book of mine that's super accessible online at the moment. But um, yeah, so The Shotgun Speaks is a poetry book of mine that you can pick up or you can hit up my albums. And um, I have a website as well, carryrudzinski.com. And we'll put that, we'll put that in the links below. So thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, it's really, really appreciate this. Uh, you taking the time to talk with the. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's nice to see you. Like, this whole crew, but you know, I take the time. <laughs> Got to. Just for the job you want. So yeah, thank you for taking this time with us and uh, really appreciate, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.